Hi, and welcome to Menlo Church Online. Menlo is a place where we believe that everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything is possible. We really hope you enjoyed today's message. So sit back and relax, and here we go. Well, hi, everybody. My name's John, and I'm a sinner. Okay, your job then is to say, hi, John, in a real kind of friendly way so that I actually feel encouraged to be open and transparent and confessional. So let's try it one more time. Hi, everybody. My name's John. I'm a sinner. That's much better. Uh, Jesus made this remarkable statement in Luke chapter 12 where he said to his followers, don't be afraid, little flock, for my Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. And when I think about that, I'd like a life that's beyond fear, to not be afraid. And I'd like to live in the reality of that kingdom, love and joy and peace. Um, but if I'm going to do that, if I'm going to change, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I need help. I need a way of life that keeps me close to God, that keeps my mind aware of His presence, and through which I can receive the power to do what I cannot do on my own. I need a way of life that's not legalistic or superficial or mechanical, but at the same time isn't just the same old way that everybody drifts through life in. Now, many times people think that being a Christian is mostly about professing the right beliefs, but it is not. One of the great illusions, even amongst church people, is that information alone will produce transformation. Information is very important, but it's not sufficient. It's fascinating that in the early days of the church, the name that was given to people in the Jesus community was followers of the way. And you see that in Acts 9 and Acts chapter 22 and lots of other places. They did not call them believers in the creed. Now, creed is real important. Believing what you believe is real important. They were sometimes called believers. But in the New Testament, in the Greek language, the word for belief and the word for trust is the identical same word. And so anytime you see that word, you could translate it to people who trust. And to trust Jesus means precisely to follow in his way. Uh, the way that they lived is actually described in Acts chapter 2, and in the series, we're going to take a look at that together. So over the next nine weeks, we're going to get what you might think of as a discipleship pathway or a spiritual program or a framework. We're going to learn a way of life together as disciples, students, learners, apprentices of Jesus. It involves practices or steps taken directly from the New Testament. It is informed by the 12 steps because the 12 steps actually got borrowed from the church and the church needs them back. We're calling this series The Way. And if you want to benefit from it, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to the whole series. I'm going to ask you, if you want to benefit from it, come every week kind of live with these truths, these steps. If you have to go out of time, go online to catch the message. When you come every week, come with raw honesty and a deep, joyful sense of overpowering personal spiritual inadequacy. Some of you look way too put together, so go have more problems this week and come back messier. We are liars, cheats, gossips, failed parents, cranks, the greedy and the needy, the anxious and the proud, and we cannot afford to live in pretense and hiding. We can't afford that. We want to give some resources and tools so that we can all be on this journey together every day through the week. We're giving away this devotional calendar so you can make this series a part of your daily life. Don't have to be heroic, just steady. There's a way to begin the day and a way to end the day with God. And then we're giving away these little green wristbands as reminders. They say the way on them. They're kind of like a spiritual Fitbit. Since we live in Silicon Valley, they have a special design that will actually give you a little electric shock when you sin. Um, it's got a little tracking device, so our elders will know where you are at all times. 
And uh, I will tell you real frankly that what will make this series used by God in your life is not mainly what you hear during the sermons. I'm going to try to make them as clear and helpful and spiritually practical as I can. Uh, but, but, but what will impact you is what you do in between the sermons together with God. And it's always been that way for people following Jesus. I want to encourage you, uh, make sure you're in a life group, and then pick another person and talk with them about how it's going on the way. What are you learning? Where are you getting messed up? Where are you finding God? Ask them to pray for you, and you pray for them. Learn about it together. And if you're not ready to do that, I understand we're to talk about that step more fully in this series. The goal is not for this to be a series that we finish and everybody is done with. These are steps or practices that are grounded in Scripture that have been used, tested, helpful to followers throughout the centuries that we arrange our life around in a coherent way to help us live close to God, receive power from God as long as we're living. So the idea is that we're never, ever done with this. We're going to be learning spiritual steps arranged around up, in, and out, three, three ups and three ins and three outs because we use that structure around here. Today's step is the foundation. It's the uh, uh, grounds for everything else that we will learn and do. And if you don't get this one, everything else can kind of mess you up because you can turn it into just stuff that's kind of a self-help program. You can summarize this step number one in two words, give up. Surrender your life and your will fully to God. And this is expressed in the most famous prayer of all time. It's called the Lord's Prayer in a single phrase where Jesus says, your will be done. And we're all going to carry that prayer with us today. So let's say those four words together out loud. Your will be done. Amazing thing about this prayer is you can pray at any time. When you're frustrated because you're in a traffic jam because you can't control the traffic. When you're worried about one of your kids because you can't control them. When you're mad at your spouse because you can't control them. When you're mad because you don't have a spouse because you're not in control of that. When your computer crashes. When you did not get accepted into the school. When you did not get that job or that promotion. When you were hoping she would say yes, but she said no. When you were hoping that she would say yes and she did say yes, but then you were wishing she had said no. When you're worried about money. When you lay dying. You say this prayer. Something in the universe unlocks when you surrender your will. It's like a key to a door, somebody wrote, that opens almost all by itself, and inside we see a pathway with an inscription that says, this is the way to a faith that works. And it does work. I will tell you what's so amazing about this prayer and why I need it so much. I've been a Christian long enough, I'm spiritually mature enough now that I only have two problems, only two. Some of you have lots of them, I only have two. One of them is that I do things I don't want to do, and the other one is I don't do things that I do want to do. Anybody else have either one of those problems? I say, don't eat that, then I eat it. Don't drink that, then I drink it. Don't smoke that, then you smoke it. Don't look at that sight. Don't wimp out. Don't procrastinate. Don't brag. Don't envy. Don't yell at the kids. Don't say, you look just like your mother, and then those words come out of my mouth. Paul said, I do not understand what I do. For, uh, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. I have a desire to do good but I cannot carry it out. This is the human condition. We want to do what is good, but we are prepared to do what is wrong if we feel like we got to do it to get what we want. And most people think that the response to this, even if you become a Christian, is try harder. Try harder to be like Jesus. Try harder to obey God. Try harder to become a better person. But any addict will tell you and whether or not you have an identified addiction to some substance or some behavior, every one of us has a heart that's a little idol factory. And, and what we call addictions in the biblical times were generally called idolatries. Every one of us is attached to the wrong stuff. Any addict will tell you, you will come to the place where trying harder ain't going to get it done. And by the way, by the way, if you're just exploring faith, this is why surrender is important to you, even if you do not believe in God yet. Here's reality. There is my will, what I want, getting my way, and then there is doing the right thing, what is good, 
what is noble, what is courageous, what's generous, what's truthful. How many have ever found that at least once in your life, maybe more, getting your way is not the same thing as doing the right thing? And if your hand is not raised right now, you're doing the wrong thing right now. <laughs> Even if you don't believe in God, see, to live with an unsurrendered will is to cut against the grain of the moral universe. Good exists, even if I don't want it, whether or not you believe in God. Reality, including spiritual reality, exists, even if I don't like it. It's as though goodness and spiritual reality are like a mighty river. And when I surrender my will, when I say, I'll no longer always just try to get my way, but I will seek to do what is good, what is honorable, what is true. It's like I'm suddenly moving with a current that is far greater than myself. And no one has ever lived this, modeled it, taught it, identified it with greater clarity than this man, Jesus. He expresses it over and over, unforgettably with these words, whoever wants to become my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And you can discover this if you run the experiment. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever wants to lose their life for me will find it. A lot of confusion about what does it mean to take up your cross and deny yourself. It simply means to say that my desires, what I want, are no longer my ultimate goal. I am willing to give up what I want in order to do what is good. That's what it means to take up your cross, to deny yourself. My life is no longer primarily about getting my own way. So the first step of spiritual life, this is the foundation for everything else, is not to exert my will, to try harder, but to surrender my will. It's fascinating. You may know that AA got its 12 steps from a discipleship movement called the Oxford Group. More than a century ago it was around. First three steps are, we admitted we were powerless over our problems. Our lives had become unmanageable. And then we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity if we let him. And then step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. And these are sometimes summarized in three great phrases. I can't, God can, I think I'll let him. So let's say those three together out loud. I can't, God can, I think I'll let him. That's the foundation. I can't do what? I can't fix myself. I can't fix you. I can't remove my guilt. I can't help that I'm an alcoholic or a rageaholic or a workaholic or a greedaholic or an imageaholic or a judgmentaholic. I can't give myself a personality transplant. I can't be the man, husband, friend, father, person, pastor. I know I'm called to be. I can't control my worry or my lust or my eating. I can't. God can. I think I'll let him. Have you prayed this prayer? Have you taken in this step, honestly. Now, a lot of people I know in our day are afraid of surrendering to God. They think that it means mindless obedience or robotic conformity. It does not, not at all. Your will, your will is precious to God. There was a movie years ago called The Stepford Wives. In the community of Stepford, the men are mostly high-tech workers. Their wives behaved strangely. They were ecstatic about cleaning house and baking. They gathered to exchange recipes and coo over each other's clean floors. They had no opinions. They never argued or complained. They lived to make their husbands' lives grander and more comfortable. But they were robots, so it is a horror movie. Husbands uh, uh, ended up having a movie uh, made about them called Stepford Husbands. It's a true story. It was so popular. There's another movie called Stepford Husbands, and in that movie, it's husbands who are unfailingly pleasant and great cooks and love to do laundry. My wife didn't think it was a horror movie. She thought it was an inspiring romantic comedy. And then there was a third movie, again, not making this up, called Stepford Children, all about a group of children who become homework-loving, room-cleaning, preppy-dressing little overachievers who are polite and diligent and devoted to having great GPAs and impressive internships when they're in the third grade. And in this movie, it's the Stanford children, sorry, the Stepford children who become little <laughs> robots of achievement and pleasure and so. Now, what all these movies show, in the words of one writer, is that in close personal relationships, Conformity to another's wishes is not desirable, be it ever so perfect, if it is mindless 
or acquired at the expense of freedom and the destruction of personality. And we all know this. What these kind of silly movies show that's profoundly true is a world with persons, even with all its pain, is infinitely better than a world with no pain but no persons. See, the Stepford world will be a world where there's no pain, suffering's all gone, but it's a nightmare because there's not persons, there's not meaning. God does not want robotic conformity or drones or clones. God wants persons. Kingdom life is personal life. God wants persons with joyfully, creatively, intelligently surrendered wills because God is God and I am not God. And because it's, it's precisely my will, my selfish, unsurrendered, self-centered, self-promoting will that's actually my problem. Here's how the book of AA describes the problem. Each person is like an actor trying to run the whole show is forever trying to arrange the lights, the scenery, the rest of the players in his own way. If his arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as he wished, the show would be great. And that's the way it seems to me. I want my own little Stepford world where everybody does my will, where my will is done. I want a Stepford spouse, little Stepford children, a Stepford job, a Stepford church, a Stepford dog. But of course, this puts me on a collision course with everybody else in the world because they all have their will. The bad news is, I can't. The good news is, God can. The question is, have you let him? This is the foundation. I'll tell you one amazing God can moment. About 100 years ago, a wealthy, gifted young businessman named Roland was secretly a hopeless drunk, locked up countless times, had enough money to cover it up, but knew he was headed for insanity or death. So desperate that he ended up going to Europe for a year to be treated under the care of a quite famous psychiatrist named Carl Jung. And he left Jung sober, convinced that he was now so self-aware that he had alcohol licked, but he got drunk before he reached the boat to go back home. He went back to Jung. Now you think about this. Carl Jung said to him, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic I have never seen one single case recover if it's as bad as you. Roland said it was like the gates of hell clanged shut on him. And he said, is there no exception? This is Carl Jung. Yes, one. Here and there, alcoholics have what are called vital spiritual experiences. They find God, hope for you, will be found there if it will be found at all, said Carl Jung. And Roland found God, had a vital spiritual experience in a little fellowship of disciples, followers of Jesus, called the Oxford Group, who were devoted to these steps. And, and that eventually led to a man who would be, become known as Bill W. and then Dr. Bob and then AA. I can't, God can. God can give an alcoholic power to be sober, not just that. God can give a, a greedy, corrupt old tax collector named Zacchaeus the power to become the poster boy for generosity. God can give a frightened failure by the name of Simon the power to become a courageous leader named Peter. God changed the hater of Peter named Saul into a, a lover of people named Paul. And Paul said, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. See, we think of surrender as a weak act for weak people. But the great discovery of spiritual reality, seen by Jesus, seen by Paul, seen by countless others through the centuries, rediscovered by AA, is that surrender is the pathway to power. And I have felt that. Times when I wanted to snap in anger or withhold in apathy or withdraw and practice my spiritual gift of pouting and a little voice says, nope, not that way, not your will. I was studying and writing on precisely this step, reading the Bible and uh, the big book from AA, uh, all about how do you handle, hand your life and will over to God. And I got a text from a man that I hardly know. I didn't want to get interrupted, but he was asking if I would call him 
And, and, and a little voice inside said, call him now. So I did. I just called him right then. This is someone I had met one time. His first words to me were, I can't believe you called me this fast. I texted because I was desperate and did not know who to talk to. I realized I'm an alcoholic and I needed to talk to somebody, so I called you. Can you help me? I can't. God can. I think I'll let him. We made a decision to turn our wills and our lives over to the care of God. Now, of course, our egos will give us lots of reasons why we should not do this. I might miss out on what I really want, the money or the sex or the pleasure or the reputation or whatever that I got to have. If I did that, if I surrendered to God, God would probably make me be a monk or a nun or a missionary or a pastor or something awful. I'd be unable to think about for myself anymore. I would live in chronic deprivation of the stuff that I really want if I'm going to have any gratification in life. I would become a doormat, a weak, dependent personality. But it actually works the other way around. See, if I'm dependent on God, then I'm no longer dependent on money for my security. I'm not dependent on attractiveness for my worth. I'm not dependent on circumstances for my peace. I'm not dependent on my children's lives for my well-being. Can I get an amen from anybody on that one? I'm not dependent on your approval for my confidence. The more I depend on God, the more independent I actually become in real life. And now let's take it a little deeper. In, in Luke's version, Jesus adds a very little helpful word to this idea of surrender. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. People wonder sometimes, is surrender a once-for-all deal? Well, there has to be a once. You don't drift into it. But then... It's all the time. It's every day. And here's why. Here's the thing about my will. I turn it over to God, and then I take it back. And I turn it over, and I take it back. And I turn it over. Here you are, God, and then I take it back. I think I'm surrendered. I'm an introvert, so I often enjoy being alone. Sometimes I even enjoy talking with God. I'm at home practicing the prayer of surrender. God, have it all. My money, my energy, my family, my will, my relationships, my time. I surrender it all. Your will be done. I'm actually quite moved by how devout my surrender is. And then my wife says, hey, honey, would you please clean the garage like you said you were going to do? No, stop interrupting me. I've surrendered everything to Jesus, and you're getting in the way. God, I said your will be done, not her will be done. I think I've surrendered my time until somebody wants it. I think I've surrendered my money until somebody needs it. I think I've surrendered my circumstances until they don't suit me. I think I've surrendered my will until it gets crossed. I'm never done learning this prayer. But the beauty of this prayer, part of why it's the foundation, is you can pray it all day long and it will never cease to energize you. It will never cease to fill you up again. It's kind of like breathing. Living with a freshly surrendered will is the foundation. The big book of AA puts it like this. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Now, that is just profound truth about the nature of discipleship, following Jesus. That's why if I'm doing it rightly with this as a first step, it could never lead to like that elder brother pride judgment you know, looking down, what we have is just a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all our activities. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not my be done. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is the proper use of the will. This is extraordinary wisdom. Now, we have wills, and our wills are amazing things. A guy in our day, a psychologist named Roy Baumeister, is kind of the guru of research into willpower. Will's a real thing. And you use it when you do things like resist temptation, or when you get creative, or when you're making decisions, or when you're doing impression management. And that's why, for example, it's kind of exhausting to go on a first date with somebody or to go to a job interview. You go back home and say, man, I'm so tired, I just want to be myself, because it takes willpower to try to get other people to think I am something different than I actually am. There is one thing the will can do and never grow tired, and that is surrender. Our wills get depleted real easily, 
except you can surrender all day long. Now you go home and test this. Dallas Willard used to say, our wills are made to surrender to God. And that's simply true. One of the classic stories in the big book is an alcoholic doctor who was not surrendered for so long, and he was convinced that his difficulties were due to everybody and everything except him. He writes, you'd drink too if you had my problems. You'd drink too if you had my marriage. He writes, it's not that I didn't care enough about my wife. I cared too much. I sent her to four consecutive psychiatrists, and not one of them got me sober. I also sent my kids to psychiatrists. I remember even the dog had a psychiatric diagnosis. I yelled at my wife, what do you mean the dog just needs more love. You tell that dumb cat and dog doctor he's not a Beverly Hills psychiatrist. All I want to know is why does that dog wet in my lap every time I hold him? Parenthesis, that dog hasn't wet my pants once since I joined AA and neither have I. And then he writes about finally accepting his powerlessness and this amazing discovery. Acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way that it is supposed to be at this moment. I needed to concentrate not on what needs to be changed in the world as much as what needs to be changed in me. Acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. I can't. God can. I think I'll let him. Your will be done. So, welcome to the way. Here we go. It all begins with the surrender of our life and our will as we turn them over to God. That's the foundation. Now this week, if surrender is hard for you, and it will be, if your will pushes back, and it will push, I want you to know You are not alone. You don't do this on your own. People sometimes point out the great contrast between two of history's most famous martyrs, Jesus and Socrates, the Greek philosopher. You might know his story. Socrates is condemned to die. You have to take the hemlock. He's incredibly calm and stoic and peaceful, even comforts his friends. Jesus is not calm. He was a person of great faith and great courage. And yet in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's said to be in agony. He's groaning in prayer. He's sweating like drops of blood. He's got friends around him, but he's not comforting anybody. I wonder why is this scene so different with Jesus than it is with Socrates? You know, I was thinking this week, getting ready for this message. Through all eternity, the Son has willed what the Father willed. Even all through his earthly life, Jesus delighted to do the will of his Father. His great prayer was, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He loved his Father's will so much, he said to his disciples, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, like it feeds me. And then in the garden, when he is facing not just death, not just death on a cross, but what he will call on the cross, God forsakenness. God abandonment, the weight somehow of the alienation and death and sin and hell of every human broken soul is crushing him. In the garden, he tells his father, he doesn't want that. If you're willing, take this cup from me. Maybe part of the pain of Gethsemane was for the first time in all eternity, the Son now has to struggle with not wanting the will of the Father. The Son realizes this is what it is to not want what my Father wants, to desire what is opposed to my Father's desire. All of us know this. This is the fracture in our soul. To know what is good, what is God's will for my life, and to not want it, And then they have to choose God's will or mine. This is like the drama of every human life in him. And it's like all heaven is holding its breath. And then Jesus makes his choice. Not my will, yours be done. And then the next line, much less famous, 
but it says such wonderful things about life in his kingdom. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Jesus surrenders his will to his Father, and an angel from heaven comes and strengthens him. And by that way, I believe that angel is still on duty, and he makes house calls. So I want to give you a chance to surrender today. Maybe you have never deliberately turned your will and your life over to God. So this can be your this can be your vital spiritual experiences. Here and there, Jesus comes. It's kind of like this. In a wedding, there are a lot of peripheral details. There's flowers and music and guests and special clothes and decoration. But what makes it a wedding is a promise, a vow, a commitment. Nancy and I stood on a platform a long time ago, and the pastor asked her, do you take this man? And there was a long pause. I thought of all the guys she had dated and gone out with. She had had a lot of boyfriends. But then she said, yes, I take him. Not all those other losers. And then, <laughs> and then he asked me, do you take this woman? And I'd never even had a single serious girlfriend, so for me it was real quick. Here's the question for you today. Do you take this man Jesus to be your forgiver and your friend and your shepherd and your guide and your leader, your Lord? And if not him, who else? So I want to invite you as we start this journey together to make this decision. Would everybody bow your head and close your eyes for a moment? And if you never have before, uh, I, I want to invite you to pray this prayer. God, I can't. I can't save my own life. I can't earn my way to heaven. I cannot transform myself. But God, you can. You can forgive my sin through what Jesus did on the cross. You can enter into my mind, my thoughts, my desires, my life. You can guide me with your spirit. You can make me into a new person. I let you. I invite you. Today, I turn my life and my will into your care. And just keep your heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. If you've made that decision today for the first time, I want to invite you to raise your hand real quickly just so I can see and pray for you. Yep, 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 God bless you. Yep, 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 God bless you. God, thank you that you are in the life-saving, life-changing business. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for those of you who made that decision, raise your hands. I want to uh, just tell you we're so glad for you, so uh, excited for your journey together with God. Take this calendar home with you, and uh, you could just write your name on here, and then today's day to remind you, you belong to God. And that will be true through all of eternity. Um, maybe you didn't make that decision today, you're not ready yet, just keep coming back, keep learning, have an open heart, open mind. Maybe you've done this before, but you need a fresh surrender right now. Maybe it's a particular area in your time, in your money, in a relationship, in a habit, uh, with a desire. Maybe you want to say, God, I'm surrendering these next nine weeks. I'm just, I'm in, I'm devoted, I'm going to follow every day, I'm going to surrender my time to you and come on this journey with us. And then this week, take this prayer with you into this week. When you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, when you're agitated, when you're doubtful, when you're confused, when you're bored, when you're troubled, when you're afraid, when you're stressed, your will be done, your will be done, your will be done. Just make this an experiment of surrender this week. And we're going to close by saying the serenity prayer, and then we'll sing a final expression of surrender. Let's pray the serenity prayer together. God, grant me the serenity to accept what I cannot change, the courage to change what I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. I'll see you next week.
Thanks for joining us. We really hope you enjoyed the message and that you took something from it that you can apply to your own life. If you want to keep up with what's going on at Menlo, follow us on social media, and we hope to see you again soon.